Hello, I'm Mark Moody Stewart. I'm a geologist and a businessman who has spent most of my career, all of my career, in oil and gas and mining, living and working in about uh, 10 different countries. What we're going to talk about is oil and gas, and first of all, its origins. Uh, hydrocarbons form from the burial of plant and animal material, burial and heating in sediments in the Earth's crust. The nature of the hydrocarbons depends partly on the composition of the original material and partly on the heat history. So natural gas has more hydrogen and less carbon. Heavier hydrocarbons are more carbon intensive and more difficult to produce. Once they've been generated, they migrate to a reservoir, a trap, where they segregate by gravity with gas on top, oil in the middle and water underneath. And that's how we produce them. Drill a hole in that and Bob's your uncle. There have been five major advances in technology in the last 30 years. The first one is one of imaging, seismic imaging, 3D seismic, which gives us a much better picture of the, the reservoir and has brought our success rate ratio up from about 1 in 10 to over 50-50. The second uh, one is long-reach horizontal drilling. That's instead of going straight down, you go along perhaps for three or four kilometers, and that increases the drainage from the reservoir and reduces the impact on the surface, many wells from one pad. The third one is offshore. Initially, we drilled platforms on longer and longer legs out into deep water until we got to about a thousand feet with so much steel that it was uneconomic. And then that went to floating, either tethered to the bottom by uh, tendons or actually not tethered at all, simply kept in place by propellers and computers. The fourth uh, improvement is what we call smart wells. And now we're getting up to nowadays which is the control of production in long-reach horizontal and other wells where you can open and shut and measure what's coming. If there is water coming in, you can close a horizon, open another, and so on. Very critical to the efficient production. The last one is the one you've all heard about, which is fracking, which is getting material from uh, very tight, impermeable reservoirs being able to extract it using long-reach horizontal wells. Those technologies were largely introduced by the major oil companies working with service companies. The exception is fracking, which was pioneered by small independent companies and the service companies. In refining and marketing, what we call the mid and downstream production is the upstream. Uh, the big uh, advances are in refining. In the old days, we used to simply distill the oil, take the transportation fuel off, and we were left with a large amount of fuel oil or tar which we put on the roads. Nowadays, by cracking the hydrocarbons and adding more and more hydrogen to it, so lightening and decarbonizing the barrel, uh, we have all transportation fuel refineries. About 10% of hydrocarbons goes into petrochemicals and lubricants, and that's important because it will be difficult for the world to live without those. Now let's look at the organization of the industry, the structure of the industry. Up to the 50s, the industry was dominated by seven large international companies, what Enrico Mattei and the Italian state oil company called the Seven Sisters. They were partly successors to Rockefeller's Standard Oil, so Exxon, Mobil, and Chevron. Also Gulf, now part of Chevron. Texaco, now part of Chevron. Mobil is, of course, now part of Exxon. And the Europeans, Royal Dutch Shell and Anglo-Iranian, now BP. In the 50s, with the formation of OPEC, OPEC, the Gulf countries, mainly uh, the countries in the Middle East, and Venezuela formed OPEC to challenge the dominance of these major companies, who they believed acted in a cartel fashion to exploit the resources and keep prices down. Prices were in the two to three dollar a barrel range. But OPEC didn't really have any effect until the 1973 
Arab-Israeli war, when uh, OPEC flexed its muscles and applied boycotts to the Western nations and pushed up the price of oil. The boycott was based on the perceived support of the United States and Britain for the Israelis. That really brought a catastrophic change, cataclysmic change, to the industry. The, the result of uh, the boycott also stimulated and accelerated the nationalization of the industry. So that in the major producing areas, and OPEC and others control 75% of the world's conventional resources, the major oil companies lost their playground and they were forced to move elsewhere. And that carries lessons for today. When they moved somewhere else, they moved to the North Sea, the cold, rough waters of the North Sea, or the Arctic of, of the Alaskan North Slope. They were pioneering, and the costs of those projects overran. Most pioneering projects overrun their cost by about a factor of two. Uh, when they overran, ironically, they were saved by the price increases forced by OPEC. It would not have worked without it. So you have a migration of technology and capital to new areas where it's blocked in another area for whatever reason. And that's a very important driver in the, in the industry. Many people forecasted that this growth of oil outside OPEC would be constrained. Most forecasts for a period of perhaps 20 years showed a five-year forward increase and then a collapse. And this never happened. Technology was always creating new sources, new methods, the technological changes I talked about earlier. This is fundamental to this industry and frankly to any other industry. So where do the players stand now? Well, the national oil companies have reserved access very often to the hydrocarbons in their own country, which they can develop in partnership with international oil companies or with service companies, or entirely on their own. That's a big advantage. The Emirates and Nigeria, for example, go into partnership. Others, like Saudi Aramco, do it on their own, but using the technology of service companies. There is a wide range of national oil companies. The big bane of national oil companies is that their governments, who control them, drain them of capital so that they cannot develop. And this has been the destruction of Petroleos de Venezuela in Venezuela, National Iranian Oil Company, and to some extent Pemex in Mexico, and Petrobras. Petrobras has survived quite well, but, but is struggling with it. Saudi Aramco is an exception because it's been protected from this and always allowed to invest adequately. So you get a range of companies, uh, state oil companies, from those who are in a competitive open market to those who are in a completely restricted market. In general, those in competitive markets with competition, allowing competition, flourish better. Competition is a great stimulator. An exception to all of this are the Chinese, as usual. The Chinese companies, they have many state companies, and they compete between themselves. So what of the uh, national, uh, the international, the major international uh, companies? Well, they have had to rely on the strength of their technology and their capital. And their technological advantages have drained away a bit. They've lost quite a lot to service companies and also to major companies like uh, Saudi Aramco. But they have certain advantages, deep operating experience and a size which allows them to invest in new projects on their own with the capital capacity to, to do it. A third strength is actually the integration. They have access to markets. And that is something which many of the national oil companies envy them for. Many of the producing companies, while in the West, people worry about security of supply. In the major producing countries, 
They worry about security of offtake. At times of low demand, they want their oil in the market. So that's a possible alliance. The major service companies, such as Schlumberger and uh, Halliburton, have now technology as good as the majors, as a result of a cutback in expenditure from the majors. The service companies, in alliance with uh, major national oil companies, now develop fields and are essentially international oil companies. With one exception, they don't put risk capital in. They, they take a fee for service. The independent oil companies have always played an important part, and particularly in the United States, where there is an absolute plethora of, uh, of independent oil companies. There's also an increasing role for independent refining companies and independent uh, retailing of, of fuels. One of the strengths of the uh, international oil companies, which I mentioned, was the integration. But that comes under challenge now, and for, as a result of the availability of trading, that integration is no longer necessary, and we begin to see the split up into major upstream companies and downstream companies. Now let's talk about the role of trading in the industry. The major companies, integrated companies, have always traded with each other in order to fill gaps and shortcomings in, in their uh, supply chain from production to uh, retail. But increasingly, independent traders have grown up, companies like Glencore and Vitol, who trade independently with the majors, with the national oil companies, and with independents. And this has allowed the uh, industry to fragment into upstream producers, downstream producers, and so on. Natural gas is also traded, but only where there is easy access to pipeline gas. Natural gas is about six times the 6,000 times the volume of oil for the same energy unit. So in order to transport it, we have to compress it and stuff it into pipelines to transport it. Or if it's too far to build a pipeline, we liquefy it and put it in ships. Liquefied natural gas is then in a different market, somewhat disconnected from the pipeline gas. As a result of this, differences have grown up between the regions. You have a, a North American market, strongly influenced by, by shale gas, uh, where the prices are now relatively low, $2, $3, perhaps $4. European market, with a lot of gas coming from Russia, much of that gas originally linked to the price of, of oil, with kind of intermediate prices beginning to break up, and a possibility of linking those markets by liquefied natural gas. But that's difficult, because the liquefaction of gas in the United States, which is uh, low-cost gas and surplus, is expensive, environmentally difficult, and the pipelines are subject to protests. So it's not happening very quickly. Gas from fields which are too far from markets to be transported by pipeline, so-called stranded gas, is liquefied and sold mainly into the markets of the Far East, the energy poor markets of Japan and Korea, and some into, into Europe. And that, historically, has always been traded against the alternative fuel, which was oil. So you have a market in the Far East, in Japan and Korea, where the cost per million thermal units is something like $15, $16, and a market in the United States where it's only 2 to $3. And the question is, when will these differences break down, with Europe being somewhere in the middle? This is a huge industrial advantage to the United States. Now. What is the likely future and the balance between the various uh, players? The balance shifts continually, depending on the state of health of the national oil companies, whether they're in a state of collapse in some areas, or flourishing, or becoming private companies, uh, how the growth of the minor companies, the small independents, gets on, what's happening to the majors, and, and so on. 
and all, of course, with the challenge of climate change in the, in the background. I think the answer is that the future lies absolutely in technology, competition, and the access to capital. History shows us that that's always been the determinant of the balance in, in the oil industry. And I'm sure it will be in the future. Thank you.